Good morning. Welcome back to the Broadcast Retirement Network. I'm Jeff Snyder. This is BRN Weekly for Saturday, May 27th, 2023. And our top story today is the debt ceiling conversation debate dragging down markets. And joining me now to break it all down, Jane King, financial journalist, joining us this morning from the NASDAQ. Jane, great to see you as always. Hope you had a great week. Thanks so much for joining us on the program this morning. Oh, thanks. Always great to be with you, Jeffrey. Yeah, it's always it's always great to get your, I would say, instant analysis or thoughtful analysis. That's what I'm going to say. Okay. <laughs> I, you know, I really love the thoughtful analysis. Uh, Jane, let's let's start off with the uh, the debt ceiling because uh, though neither of us are in Congress uh, or in the White House, this seems to be consuming the conversation around markets. And I want to get your reaction this week to the the market reaction around the debt ceiling conversation. Yeah, well, we did feel a little bit negative when we got that uh, message from Fitch ratings um, that the AAA credit rating for the U.S. is on negative watch. So they didn't change it, but they definitely indicated, well, we're going to keep an eye on this thing because uh, there was political partisanship. It, it seemed like a little bit like two steps forward, one step back kind of thing. Um, it feels a little more positive today. Uh, so we'll we'll see what happens with this. But I think overall, and even Fitch said this in their comments, that most people and on Wall Street believe there will be an agreement reached of some sort, some kind of resolution. We're not going to default on the debt, in other words, uh, even if it's an extension or to push it back a little bit. Um, but there are reports that maybe there's a two-year deal in the works. So that would be really encouraging. So um, I, I think most people realize that both sides know this would be just absolutely devastating. Um, no, There would be no winners in this and uh, that they need to come up with something. And so I think we will see a, resolu a resolution, but they'll take it down to the wire as usual. Yeah, I mean, uh, this is uh, we're gonna actually going to have a show on this when we come back from the holiday uh, talking about the debt ceiling and what it could mean to retirees, but but I, I think you're right. I just it just is eerily familiar to some of the other. Uh, it, you know, you live long enough and you you start to see history repeat itself. All right, Jane. The next question I want to ask is about artificial intelligence because you know from Chat GPT and now Microsoft, Google, you name it. Everyone's talking about AI, and that that is that the new the new flavor for Wall Street these days. Well, I, it definitely is in this quarter. I mean, if you listen to earnings reports, everybody was sprinkling AI in there as much as they possibly could. I mean, even companies that weren't even related to AI, we're talking about AI. And of course, we saw NVIDIA's just blow out quarter, uh, strong orders for their AI chips, not just now, but going forward several quarters. Um, so NVIDIA is on its way to being our next trillion dollar value company, very exclusive club there. I think there's like five now, Apple and Google and Amazon and Microsoft, I believe, are the others. So, um, you know, that just shows that, and I don't know if you've ever used this chat GPT, but um, so we, my husband and I, my son, were kind of messing with it. And we were like, chat, you know, give us a story about my husband's name is Gene, mean Gene rescuing Princess Jane. And in about 20 seconds, it came up with you know, not a long story, but probably six paragraphs um, about how Mean Gene, who was had the misleading name, was what they said, um, that he was really full of character and he rescued. It was unbelievable. And it was well written and interesting and um, quick. And it was super quick. And my husband owns a fitness facility. So he asks uh, Chat GPT to come up with workouts for people. And they'll come out, come up with them in 10 seconds. It's just unbelievable. So I think these, like, I think AI uh, is maybe a little hyped at the moment, but I do think this has the opportunity to revolutionize the way business, you know, operates and, uh, you know, especially legal and coding and, and some of those jobs where AI's applications could be first seen. Yeah. And, and Jane, do you think they're eventually they're going to be a deep fake Jeff Snyder and a deep fake Jake, Jane King? <laughs> Um, well, if I can sleep in a little bit, you know, I wouldn't be so opposed to that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, there was a, not to go off tangent, and I know we only have a couple more minutes, but there was a movie, Looker, from the 1980s, where they digitized models. And that's what it, Albert Finney, the late Albert Finney, was, it was a great movie. Um, no, I, but, 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 but they digitized the models, and then they got rid of the models. They killed them. Uh, uh, and I'm not suggesting they would do that here. I mean, it's a little uh, well, dystopian. And you saw the um, that AI generated photo of the Pentagon and some kind of explosion at the Pentagon this week, and the markets fell on that. 
So um, this is, you know, these computer generated images, I think that's the number one problem we're going to have to deal with, even before job loss, is identifying that so people know what's fake and what's real. Yeah, yeah, a really, really important. Jane, last question. I can't, can't let you go. We're heading into the Memorial Day weekend. Of course, this is airing during the Memorial, Memorial Day weekend, but uh, plans for you and your family, how do you generally spend the, the weekend? Well, my daughter's on a 14-year-old softball team, so I'm going to have a lot of softball this weekend. i um, going to grab the lawn chair and sit and watch at least four games, maybe five, depending on how they do. So that's my Memorial <laughs> weekend. Well, hey, look, that's part of being a parent. My parents came to wrestling right. matches, came to wrestling matches on the weekend. Those, those are, are grueling as well. Jane yeah. King, always great to see you. Wishing you a very happy Memorial Day. Thank, thank you so much for the thoughtful analysis, and we appreciate uh, your perspective every week. Thank you, and happy Memorial Day to everyone out there as well. Thanks, Jane. And when we come back, we'll take a look at some of our best segments for the week. You're going to want to stay tuned right here on BRN AM. Imagine a new television network that will make you richer, healthier, and in control of your financial future. This network is for the policewoman in Nashville, Tennessee, the baker in Dubuque, Iowa, the teacher in Lexington, Kentucky. We want to make the idea of savings and retirement culturally relevant. But what do you see as a defining issue of the midterms? Especially for the smaller businesses. I mean, they are the lifeblood of the American economy. Featuring exclusive interviews, current affairs, and docu-series. 33 yeah. years old, you retired early. The philosophy is money only matters if it helps you live a life that you love. But you gotta start thinking about retirement as soon as you get in. The Broadcast Retirement Network will drive very high engagement with premium partnerships. So this isn't retirement and savings for your parents or grandparents. This is for all Americans. And we're gonna change the way you think about money. Welcome to the next frontier of retirement and savings. This is BRN, the Broadcast Retirement Network. Are you stuck with a low credit score? A credit report and score that's causing you to be denied credit or pay higher interest rates than others for the same things? Then do what Terrence did and called Credit Repaired for your free credit evaluation to help restore your credit. I started thinking about buying a new house and my score wasn't where I needed it to be. I called and spoke with one of the representatives and we just had a good conversation and I, I liked what he was saying. Just one call for his free credit evaluation was all it took to start back on the track to repairing his credit. I'm seeing the deletions and I'm getting the report so I know something's being done. It does make a difference to me. All it takes is one call to get started. Credit repair has given me a second chance to have a better credit score. Don't let a low credit score hold you back another day. Do what Terrence did and make the call for your free credit evaluation. Call 800-819-4152. That's 800-819-4152. Again, 800-819-4152. Welcome back. It was a great week of topics. Of course, great guest. We kicked off the week with a look at who owns participant data in a U.S. retirement plan. Let's take a look. We have a wonderful agenda for this year's Spark to see a public policy forum. Uh, attendees will hear from a great list of subject matter experts, starting with the head economist from the Bank of America, who will provide us with an economic update. Uh, we have the uh, always popular legislative update with uh, Hill staffers, followed by uh, Ali Kawar from the Department of Labor. And then throughout the day, we will cover ESG, litigation, swing pricing, hard close, uh, secure 2.0 implementations, uh, and then uh, Social Security. Well, Jeff, back in 2021, we invited a group of plan advisors to our November forum. 
At this event, we reviewed survey results uh, from the advisor community. Uh, the response to one of many questions we asked struck a nerve. Um, and th the response showed that financial wellness was not a high priority for many plan sponsor, uh, plan, plan advisors. When we asked why, a number of advisors in the audience spoke up and said, we can't get the data we need to fulfill our commitment on this promise, so we don't want to stick our necks out uh, in front of plan participants. And that made total sense to our members. And in response to that, we held our very first data sharing and privacy um, workshop back in April of 2022. Out of that meeting, we agreed to conduct primary research on data sharing and privacy among stakeholder groups plan sponsors, plan participants, record keepers, and, and finally advisors. Um, Pam and her team can share what we learned from that. They did a great job of, um, of conducting uh, focus group research. I, we were so happy to, to partner with Spark on this and, and DC and Spark have a long history of partnering together. Uh, there certainly were some similarities uh, all collectively agree that this is top of mind and it's the level of importance was clear. But we did hear a lot of conflicts and contradictions. Uh, it was interesting that workers want more help. They clearly exp express the, the need and desire for more support from their employers to help them make financial decisions beyond the retirement plan. But these same participants also voiced some concern about sharing their data for purposes other than to address their specific financial concern. So they want help, but they also want control. And it's also interesting that while privacy was a priority for workers, uh, them not wanting their employer to be able to access some of their personal data, maybe that they would add in on debt or, or other things, but they still express trust for their employer and a desire for them to get help. Uh, and, and we saw some similar differences with employers most overwhelmingly expressed ownership of the plan data, but they weren't sure if that is a role for the plan as a plan fiduciary. Uh, so, and employers generally felt like they're, the data is owned by the individual, but they're stewards of that data. But then talking to record keepers, they kind of view things a little bit differently. They feel that they're custodians of the data and that any data, access to that data is managed and governed by the employer. Uh, so they rely strictly on the employer to provide direction and data sharing and access. It, it felt like there was a lot of gray area, one that we could see some, you know, where there were agreements and then, and then clearly points of, of differentiation. And Spark was the first financial services organization uh, to pick up on this privacy issue and engage in California. Um, uh, coming out of our April data sharing workshop and privacy workshop, uh, the group approved a framework that included, one, a comprehensive national framework on privacy and data sharing, uh, as opposed to 50 state rules. Uh, two, um, we want to see it enforced by a regulator rather than litigated in the courts. Third, we, we want to see that it's industry neutral. Um, um, and then fourth, we, we, we recognize that data and privacy within the employee benefits context is different uh, than data sharing, for instance, in, a retail, in, in retail activities. The, the demand is, it's really uh, demand coming from the, the employee base. Uh, employees are struggling with so many different uh, financial hurdles and retirement is just one aspect of their financial life. And so what's happening is they're going, they're, they're, they're oftentimes reluctant to get into a retirement savings plan because they have other financial commitments, but they need help. And so the plan sponsors are looking at our industry for that and our industry has responded with financial wellness. But the financial wellness is, is starting to collide with the privacy uh, laws and privacy is also extremely important. And so we really need to spend time to navigate through, as you say, to find that balance. 
we see that seeing from phase part one of the research and the uncertainties and the responsibility and complexity that we saw, it led us to this new phase where we're now exploring areas where we can find more agreement and create some potential solutions to increase standardization of practices and sharing and the operational guardrails that would be needed to implement these solutions. So we're again speaking with employers, consultants, advisors, and service providers to help formulate more of the needed conditions to develop these standards, whether it's through infrastructure, technology, or common practices, we haven't determined that yet, uh, but there's a critical need to standardize these practices if we want to enhance the participant experience and overall wellness, as you said. Uh, and the other part of this research that we're really excited about is we're also partnering with LIMRA in this phase and working with them on an in-depth employee survey to really try to get more nuance on the employees and their balance between privacy and needed financial wellness support. And lastly, how veterans can avoid hefty fees when filing disability claims. Let's take a look. Veterans have several avenues for which they can apply for their benefits. And of course, they are always free at any time to, to do it themselves. Um, they can go through va.gov and file a claim. But uh, historically, there's been veteran service organizations like VFW, DAV, who are accredited. And then there's accredited attorneys and agents. And those individuals are, many of them are members of our organization, the National Organization of Veterans Advocates. And accredited individuals are accountable to the Department of Veterans Affairs for the representation they provide. So we think it's really important that a veteran who feels they need representation gets it from an accredited representative. Right, so I've been doing this for about 20 years. And, um, and so the way that the system works is just to give you a little bit of background, VA actually has a duty to assist veterans in substantiating their claims. So for that reason, a veteran doesn't actually have a burden necessarily of establishing entitlement to benefits right off the bat. So I think that's important to understand from the outset because anybody who is an accredited representative and who represents veterans is not permitted to charge for a fee for filing a claim. So like Diane said, veterans can file the claims on their own. Certainly they can go to a veteran service organization like uh, DAV or VFW, something like that, and they can assist in filing that claim. Um, a lot of attorneys like myself, we also help veterans file those initial claims without any you know, charge or obligation. Um, we do not charge until or unless some sort of an appeal is necessary or um, you know, further action needs to be taken. But the reason for that is because we have to give VA that opportunity to actually assist veterans in the first instance. And I would say that, you know, that a lot, we see the cases mostly that get denied, but I certainly have lots of veterans who come to me and they get granted right off the bat. VA does what it's supposed to do. Um, and everybody is happy. So the problem that I personally have with these firms is that they are charging veterans for services or, and that, that they can get for free right now and that they should not have to pay for. Um, so. Yeah, and, I, and, I, go ahead, Diane. Oh, I'm sorry. I was just gonna jump in and say, and the law is very clear that you may not take a fee for um, presentation, preparation, prosecution of an initial claim. No one is permitted to do that. And these firms or companies really, for-profit companies are really operating in violation of the law. Diane. Well, there is definitely information on va.gov that can help guide you to the uh, service organizations that are available and can guide you to the free representation. I think that VA tries to put out a lot of information in that regard. We also advise uh, veterans and their families and our members who contact our organization about some of these unaccredited claims consultants to be sure and check. VA has a database that is available to anyone in the public that they can check to see if the person they're about to work with or who's reaching out to them about filing a claim is accredited in that database. So we would really advise people to to check and see if the person that's trying to offer their assistance is in fact accredited. Right, so part of the problem is that they're operating outside of the law as um, you know, Diane referenced before. So 
part of the problem is that we don't have any real tool for reaching them at this point. So if a veteran gets taken by one of these firms and so they, they basically charge an excessive fee um, for what they do, uh, the veteran doesn't really have a lot of recourse. There isn't really anything VA can do because VA doesn't have any statutory ability to go after them. Um, they can, I think they can uh, complain to the attorney general, they can complain to um, consumer protection. I mean, they can sort of follow those routes, but ultimately they don't really have any recourse and the government at this point doesn't really have um, any tools or anything really in place to go after these, which is why you know there's some legislation um, and play right now where we're trying to get that passed so that at least VA will be able to do that. But I know that VA has tried to educate veterans. I know that we all do. Um, a lot of veterans just don't even realize that there are representatives or people out there who can help them with these claims. And what I will also say is that some of these organizations are pretty aggressive, at least on social media, um, as far as, and, and that's, so they get out there, they really get their word out. Attorneys generally are subject to ethical rules with respect to advertising. Um, so, you know, I can't speak for, for other firms or other attorneys, but I don't, I don't see our advertising probably being as aggressive as, as what they are doing. And that wraps up this episode of BRN Weekly. Have a topic of interest, someone you think we should talk to, Drop us a line and don't forget for all the latest curated news and lifestyle, wellness, finance, tech, so much more and all in one place. Check out today's edition of our daily newsletter, The Morning Pulse. Want to search our archives, check out our latest content, visit our website and of course, all of our streaming partners. We're back again tomorrow for another edition of BRN Sunday. I'll be joined by members of the media, academia, financial services and government as we break down all the news for the week. You're not going to miss it. Until then, I'm Jeff Snyder. Stay safe, keep on saving, and don't forget, roll with the changes. Now is your opportunity to co-create content around any topic on the first lifestyle and wellness network. Reach a global audience through our platform and co-own exclusive branded content. All of our programs are available on demand and also as audio only podcasts so you can take us on the go. Broadcast Retirement Network, available anytime, anywhere, and on any device. Tax audits, tax liens, wage garnishments. Every day we hear stories like this about good folks who are simply struggling to pay their bills. Each of them are living a frightening IRS tax nightmare and they are afraid it will destroy their lives. I'm a divorced single mom and my ex-husband left me and the kids with a lot of unpaid bills, including unpaid taxes. I was really starting to show my stress on my kids because the IRS had sent me a letter demanding a huge payment from me. I couldn't afford it. So then the IRS was threatening to garnish my wages. I'm already living paycheck to paycheck. That would have put me over the edge financially. It truly seemed hopeless, but then a friend at work told her to call the tax relief line. The people at the tax relief line, they told me about something called innocent spouse relief. They worked it out so that all of the taxes from my ex are not my problem. I don't know how that works and, and I don't care. All I care about is that I don't owe the IRS a dime and they are not going to take my paycheck. Even if it seems hopeless, you should call the number on your screen right now. There is absolutely no cost for the call or the consultation. You are under no obligation. If you are worried that the IRS could garnish your wages, seize your assets, even take your home, call us right now. The tax relief line is here to help you. Now you have a knowledgeable, professional team of tax experts that are ready to negotiate with the IRS and fight for you to save you money. The Tax Relief Line's professionals have successfully negotiated thousands of cases, reducing and sometimes even eliminating the tax debt for their clients. It's very easy to get started. Simply call the number on your screen right now. You don't have to live in fear anymore. The call and the consultation are free.